Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Srinath Raghavan, a trustee of the New India Foundation. On behalf of the foundation and my fellow trustees, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Girish Karnad Memorial Lecture 2021. The New India Foundation was set up in 2004 by Nandan Nilakani and Ramachandra Guha. The foundation aims to promote high quality research and writing on all aspects of independent India. We do this in three ways. The first and most central activity is the NIF fellowships. These are year-long, handsome fellowships awarded to scholars and writers working on book-length projects pertaining to India after 1947. The NIF fellows are chosen from a pool of several hundred applicants in each round, and the foundation provides them mentorship and editorial support right through to the publication of their books. We've had 51 NIF fellows to date and 24 books published, with many more in the work. The foundation also awards the Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay NIF Book Prize for the best non-fiction book on modern and contemporary India. The prize for 2020 was awarded jointly to Amit Ahuja and Jairam Ramesh for their outstanding books on contemporary Dalit politics and on VK Krishna Menon. The foundation also hosts an annual lecture featuring eminent scholars and thinkers. This lecture was renamed after the late polymathic scholar and playwright Girish Karnad in 2019. We usually hold this in Bangalore, which is the home of the India Foundation, this year, of course, we are going digital. Our distinguished speaker today is Edward Lewis, renowned journalist, writer, and commentator. His bio is uh, available for you in the box. Uh, very briefly, he is the Financial Times' chief US commentator for the past decade. His long career has included a stint in India, which led to his first and acclaimed book, In Spite of the Gods, The Rise of Modern India in 2007. He has since gone on to write other books. Ed will be talking today about the current moment in American politics and what it portends for America and the world. I really can think of no one better place than him to reflect on this important and urgent question. After Ed's talk, my colleague and managing trustee of NIF, Manish Sabarwal, will engage with him in a conversation. Meanwhile, you can send your questions in the Q&A box. And our colleague and trustee, Professor Nirja Jayal, will finally wrap it all up. Ed, it would have been lovely to have you in Bangalore, but I'm delighted to welcome you here. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Srinath. It's um, a, a real honor to be um, invited to give this Girish Khanad Memorial Lecture. Um, uh, you're right that I, um, I think I met you and I met Manish um, in Bangalore at the Literature Festival a couple of years ago, a wonderful experience. The last time I, I went to India, I guess the pandemic has intervened. Uh, and of course, I've known Nandan and Ram for, for many, many years. Sadly, I didn't know Girish, uh, although I knew him well from a distance. Um, I, I felt I knew him as um, this multifarious, secular, creative, um, artistic, fundamentally benign um, um, person who represented the best side of India. So I'm, I'm deeply sad that I didn't know him, but very honored to be giving uh, a talk in his name. I've also, by email, got to know, um, and at the Bangalore Liter Literature Festival, got to know um, uh, Saraswati Ganapati uh, a little bit in the last couple of years, and it's a delight to have met um, her. Now, I, I will get a little bit to India towards the end of this talk, but what I want to focus on um, uh, for the most part is the current moment in American politics. Um, and of course, this is taking place against two very important backdrops. Uh, the first is that um, we have a new administration um, under uh, Joe Biden, um, a, a man who repeatedly tells us um, that America is back. And by that, I think he means that Trump um, was an aberration um, and that he's very much the corrective to that aberration. Um, that's not a view I share, but I understand um, the very um, salient politics behind this America is back um, phrase that Biden stock phrase of Biden's. Um, but I would sort of take the warning from from history from uh, Heraclitus, the Greek ancient Greek um, philosopher, which is uh, you cannot step into the same river twice. And the, um, the river that Biden got out of in 2016 as vice president to the outgoing Obama administration is a very different river um, to the one that he stepped back into. Trump has roiled the waters, if you like. 
The second context to this talk uh, is the emerging consensus that America and China are in a new Cold War, uh, that they're very much destined to be um, the grand geopolitical rivals which will dominate global geopolitics for the next, for the coming decades. Again, I'd sort of refer to an ancient Greek philosopher, though I, I, I promise this will exhaust my stock of ancient Greece, Greek philosophy, uh, namely Thucydides, who, who talked about um, the inevitable clash between uh, the existing hegemon, America, uh, and a declining one, and, and the rising one, Sparta, um, or, or China. Um, and uh, I think that that's sort of Thucydian trap, as it's called, uh, is a consensus into which Biden has walked in Washington, D.C. as president. And it's a very important, um, it's a very important piece of the um, furniture um, that wasn't there when he was last in the White House. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about U.S. democracy and its health. Uh, I live just a few miles from Capitol Hill, um, where a couple of months ago, as you know, there was this unprecedented assault on this sacred citadel of democracy um, by thousands of people, uh, some of whom had nooses, some of whom were waving Confederate flags, uh, some of whom had handcuffs, um, who were shouting things like hang Pence, hang Pelosi after the uh, Democratic Speaker of the House. Um, now, fortunately, they didn't reach any of um, uh, their political targets. Uh, there were some very close calls, um, but nobody was hanged. I have no doubt, though, if they had come across Mike Pence or any of the other people that they believed were part of a elaborate deep state plot to rob Donald, Donald Trump of the election, that there would have been violence. Um, and that the notorious, already deeply infamous um, events of January the 6th would have been dramatically uh, worse. Um, Donald Trump is now living in Mar-a-Lago and I'll get on to him a little bit later. Um, but he, I think we should remember, lost the election but he lost it with 74 million votes, which is the second highest tally of any president uh, in American history. Uh, Biden, of course, got 81 million votes and he won, uh, but he, and he is the highest tally, therefore, of any uh, American president in history. But that 74 million, those 74 million Americans who voted for Trump uh, are not going anywhere. They are, um, very much with Donald Trump in believing that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. Now I've spent um, a large chunk of my adult life living in the United States uh, and I've watched the vertiginous, vitig the steep decline um, of public faith in the democratic system here and in public institutions as a sort of um, collapse of faith. You can make an analogy with a, a retreat into atheism uh, and nihilism uh, amongst large chunks of the American population. A loss of faith in the American creed, which is meritocracy, which is equality of uh, opportunity. Uh, now, Joe Biden has a brief window, and I stress the word brief, to try and uh, redress this loss of faith whether we call it atheism or, or um, nihilism, this collapse of, um, uh, of belief in the American promise. He has a brief window, a, a reprieve, if you like, and it's a very important moment, therefore, that I'm giving this talk to you, seven weeks in to this um, new presidency. The America is back stock phrase that he uses um, means a lot in Biden's vocabulary. Um, but let me put the best possible gloss on it. I think there are some people, perhaps in India, um, certainly in Europe, who worry a little bit 
about what that means because uh, the America that existed before Trump um, wasn't necessarily good for many other parts of the world. We remember wars of choice. We remember the global war on terror. We remember the great financial crash of 2008. It's not as if Trump um, is the beginning of America's problems. Trump, in my view, is uh, very much a natural outcome to these trends that I talked about um, uh, uh, that have lasted decades. Um, the best possible gloss to put on America is back uh, is that it will promote a value-based foreign policy. Um, Biden will promote democracy. Um, he's very strongly in favor, unlike Trump, but also unlike Obama, uh, of pushing the democracy agenda globally. Um, but not in favor of wars, of wars of choice, not in favor of Iraq or Vietnam style um, coercive um, democratic ventures, um, if you like. So neither transactionalist, neither amoral like Trump was, nor is he embracing a messianic freedom agenda uh, like George W. Bush, um, not neoconservative, not isolationist. Um, and he's also aware that uh, the most important way he can promote democracy is to repair it at home in the United States, that that is the single best thing um, that, that he can do to showcase that it's alive and kicking. Um, so how's he doing so far in the first seven weeks? Um, well, I've covered several American presidents, and I've studied many more. And I think it's fair to say that uh, this first couple of months is the most um, accident-free, um, the, the smoothest opening to, to, to a presidency um, that I can remember. Uh, the um, Trump administration doesn't need um, underlining. It was a sort of rolling chaos. Um, but if you look to Obama, the Tea Party emerged very soon, within a few weeks of him becoming president, and put pretty much a stop to his domestic agenda after a couple of years. If you look to George W. Bush, uh, he passed a very unpopular tax cut in his opening months, um, unpopular even within his own administration. And then, of course, he hit the buffer of 9-11, which changed everything. Um, if you look at Bill Clinton, he got into this very early row about gays in the military um, and then launched this health care reform um, led by his wife, Hillary Clinton, known as Hillary, Claire, uh, Hillary Care, which, um, of course, came to, came to a very ignominious end um, and so on. Um, if you look back at um, the opening stages of most presidencies, they are usually um, very accident prone and this one uh, isn't. And I think um, I think it's worth stressing that Biden is a very experienced figure. A lot of us have focused on his age, which is 78, which is of course by far the oldest in American history to take office in the White House. Um, uh, but we've um, stressed his experience a bit less, which is the positive way of looking at his age. Um, Obama had spent two years in Washington as a senator. Bush had never served in Washington. Clinton had never served in Washington. George Bush Sr. had, Reagan never had, Carter never had, and so on. It's extremely unusual um, to get a president like Biden with uh, 36 years in Washington as a senator and eight years um, in Washington as vice president. I think it's safe to say that Biden is the most experienced president, incoming president in American history, perhaps with the exception of Thomas Jefferson, but I can't really think um, of any other. And that counts for something. It's, it's not, it's not a, a feature of his resume that he advertised um, during the election um, because you tend to run against Washington in America, it, politics, um, at least federal politics in America is, uh, I think, the only business I know of um, where experience counts against you. So Biden didn't advertise um, this feature, but it's 
an extremely important part of um, his makeup as a politician. He's seen this movie a hundred times before. He knows where you slip up. Um, and he's appointed people who, for the most part, I'm thinking of Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary, um, or um, uh, uh, Tony Blinken as Secretary of State, for the most part, who are also very experienced. Um, so that's one feature to his first seven weeks. The second um, quality that I think is really worth emphasizing um, is the quality that uh, uh, Bonaparte Napoleon um, said was the most important one in his generals, uh, namely luck. Biden has been fairly lucky. He came into office after, uh, really at the peak of the pandemic, um, at the peak of coronavirus death rates, the worst three months were November, December, January, just as that peak was starting to plateau, firstly. And secondly, of course, just as the vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and others, um, were starting to come online. Um, and he's fulfilling um, what I consider, and in my modest way in my career, have tried to follow the most important rule of jobs which is always follow an underperformer. Uh, Donald Trump, as you might recall, promised endlessly to find magical solutions to this pandemic, to the coronavirus. Um, uh, Biden promised 100 million jabs, 100 million vaccine shots within the first uh, 100 days. Um, now he's already achieved that in less than 50 days. So by uh, under promising and over delivering, he is really proving himself to be the mirror image um, of Donald Trump. Um, and so I think we have the very realistic prospect of um, the United States achieving herd immunity um, with every adult who wants to get in, uh, injected being uh, vaccinated um, by late May, early June which um, of course is a very powerful springboard um, for a strong economic um, recovery. Um, which brings me on to the economy. Um, last night, Biden gave his first um, Oval Office address to the nation, um, having signed a, a $1.9 trillion uh, pandemic relief bill, a stimulus basically, um, which if you combine with a $900 billion bill that was passed in the lame duck Congress in December and a $2.3 trillion bill passed last April amounts to 25% of GDP in pandemic relief, 25% of GDP over and above the normal budget. Nothing like this has been seen um, since the second world war in terms of deficit spending um, and addition to the national debt. Um, so when America says it is treating COVID-19 as a war, well, the fiscal response tends to, to back that up. Um, this is um, uh, an extraordinary shift in American politics because of the pandemic. Um, as you know, the Chinese character for crisis can also mean opportunity. Well, the left has turned this crisis in America into an opportunity. Um, uh, in 1993, Bill Clinton very famously said, the era of big government is over. Um, well, Biden, I think, is all but saying the era of big government is back. And we should not underestimate um, the importance of, of this shift. Um, it is happening. So what could possibly go wrong? Uh, I've just described to you almost the ideal opening to a, to a presidency, one that is very hard um, to, to find a parallel with in recent decades, um, and a likelihood that the remainder or most of the remainder of um, Biden's first year, it could look um, even better if herd immunity plus economic rebound um, comes as I expect both will. Um, so what could possibly go wrong? Um, well, plenty will go wrong. Um, stuff just always does go wrong. Um, let me um, highlight the two most important um, 
dangers in my view, um, but they're by no, they're by no means exhaustive. Um, the first uh, is a domestic one. The second is a foreign one. Um, let me start with the domestic one. I mentioned Donald Trump earlier on um, in, in retreat um, at his Mar-a-Lago um, club in Florida. Um, uh, Trump is continuing to allege that this election um, was rigged and stolen and upwards of 70% of his 74 million voters agree with him. Um, his party, for the most part, agrees with him. Um, when he was impeached for the second time following the January 6th storming of the Capitol Hill, what I like to think of as America's Munich Beer Hall putsch after early Hitler um, activity, um, very, very few Republicans um, voted to impeach him and still fewer voted to convict him. The same um, as uh, first time round when he was impeached in early 2020. Um, the party is with him. Um, uh, the, one of the few people who voted to convict him, um, to impeach him, was Liz Cheney, uh, the daughter of Dick Cheney, um, who Trump is now spending a lot of energy and capital because he has a, a, a very big war chest trying to um, unseat from her district. In other words, and this is, I think, a measure of where the Republican Party is, um, the Cheney family is the moderate wing. Think of it like that. Um, now, if in a two-party democracy, one party essentially rejects the democratic norms, the legitimacy of democratic outcomes, you do not have a stable democracy. Um, they, at the moment, do not have control of the House, and the Senate split 50-50 with Kamala Harris the vice president as a deciding vote. So it's just narrowly in favor of Biden. Um, but uh, the judiciary is very much on the conservative side. I think Trump's most enduring legacy um, was uh, changing the character of the judiciary. The, the Supreme Court is now 6-3 conservative um, with Trump and very strongly supportive when cases of um, uh, come to it of attempts to uh, basically reduce the electorate, make it more difficult to vote um, and to, to side with um, the suppress the vote uh, sort of tendency in the Republican Party. Since January, more than 400 bills have been um, filed um, across the 50 states in legislatures controlled by Republicans to reduce the size of the electorate to enhance um, uh, state legislature's ability to gerrymander the district boundaries to sort of shape them into ever more pretzel-like um, shapes um, that pack minority votes into one district and therefore um, make the other districts um, more likely to be Republican. The Republican party is Trump's party. And if you look at um, opinion polls amongst Republican voters, who they wish to be the presidential nominee in uh, 2024, Donald Trump comes way to the top. There's no, no one else is anywhere close to him. Um, he gets more than half. Uh, the next highest, I believe, is Mike Pence, the former vice president, with 8%. And then third is Donald Trump Jr., um, and to Indian ears, that dynastic sort of flavor will ring familiar. Um, so the populist explosion is not dead in America. Um, it's waiting in the wings for Biden to slip up. And I think that in all the sort of well-deserved plaudits for the basic minimum competence that Biden has shown so far um, is something that we should not forget. The populist, the populist moment in American politics is by no means over. The second threat um, to um, Biden is a little bit more subtle, um, but not, no, no less real because of it. And that's um, on the foreign side, and that is a misplaying of the US-China um, relationship. Um, now, Biden, as I mentioned, um, has democratic values 
uh, at the core of his foreign policy. Um, the America is back means America is a democracy promoter um, is back. Um, and that's um, potentially a very complicating um, uh, element to his foreign policy, which um, is chiefly um, about making sure that China does not ride roughshod over global rules um, and does not um, uh, continue unchecked in its rather pugilistic um, rise as, as a great global power. Um, holding other countries, allies, partners to high democratic values will complicate that. And I think India is a very good example. Um, America doesn't have a very good record of democracy promotion. Um, if you think of the uh, tiny island of Cuba, 90 miles off America's coast, for decades, America has been trying to democratize Cuba through various methods uh, without any success. Um, if you think of Afghanistan, 20 years into this war, where some of the American troops in Afghanistan today were not born when it began, $3 trillion worth of spending. Um, and um, Ashraf Ghani, its president today, has no more legitimacy in the eyes or control in the eyes of the Afghan people than Hamid Karzai did um, on day one. Uh, I think it's um, worth stressing that you know, Vietnam, which is critical to any um, uh, ad hoc series of relationships America will be seeking to deepen to counter um, China's worst instincts. Pakistan, none of these countries um, are susceptible to being told whether to democratize or not. So Biden's going to have to, Biden's going to have to uh, either say it's an empty talking point or it's going to become a problem. Um, and of course it would become a particular problem um, in the relationship um, with India. Uh, uh, fortunately, I haven't been asked to talk about Narendra Modi today um, uh, because I uh, mostly wouldn't have very good things to um, say about him. Um, but I think it's you know, worth stressing that um, whatever problems India is having with its democracy um, and whatever truth there is to the claim that America is becoming an illiberal democracy and suffering from um, an undeclared emergency and so forth and watching secularism decay, um, this is a problem for Indians to solve. Uh, this is not a problem that can be solved in the think tanks of Washington. Um, and I think and hope that the Biden administration will understand that point. I'm pretty sure they will ultimately understand it um, um, and therefore can fairly confidently predict that even if Modi, as I fear, continues in an illiberal direction, um, it will make very little difference to the fact that the United States needs India as a counterbalance to China um, and uh, will continue to seek its partnership. I did uh, briefly um, flick through Jai Shankar's book, uh, the Indian way. Um, and so I understand very clearly uh, that India does not want to become a treaty partner of the United States. And I think that's sensible um, that India in some ways will remain technically non-aligned um, even as it um, de facto cooperates more closely um, with uh, groups like the Quad um, group of Australia, Japan, the United States and India. In fact, there's a Quad meeting going on today um, that Modi and Biden um, are participating in. So uh, I, I think that point is probably well understood. Um, but there is a larger impetus in American politics to create binary choices in foreign politics. To, to some extent, um, there's a sort of pre-existing condition there to see the world in Manichaean form. Um, and we have heard talk from people in this new administration um, of there being a global conflict, um, a struggle um, uh, between autocracy and democracy. So not just a new Cold War on the geopolitical plane, 
um, between the United States and China, but an ideological Cold War, uh, much like the original um, Cold War. Uh, and I think that that's a worrying, that's a worrying tendency. It's always sort of latent um, in the American approach to foreign policy. I was talking to, um, before this um, began, I was talking a little bit to Ravi and Srinath about um, a book I'm researching um, on Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the foreign policy advisor to Jimmy Carter. And he was very much up there with Henry Kissinger as amongst the grand strategists um, of American foreign policy. And um, I had a uh, quite a long Zoom with Kissinger yesterday, age 98, um, as sharp uh, as attack, writing two books. And we got into this subject and he said something very interesting. Both of these figures, Kissinger and Brzezinski, um, are in his view, and I share it, um, not only the two most impactful um, uh, national security advisors America's had and foreign policy strategists, but no coincidence were born and raised abroad. They have, in his words, the tragedy of possibilities in their head. And Americans often don't have the tragedy of possibilities in their head. Um, so if there is a deep concern about Biden, it is this pressure that will be on him to create um, a black and white Manichaean foreign policy um, that sees the struggle with China, not as something manageable um, and messy and ad hoc, but as something um, far greater and more titanic than that. Um, and I can't be confident that, um, that Biden will be able to resist um, that narrative. Um, now, um, four years ago when Trump came in, I wrote a book called The Retreat of Western Liberalism um, about the reversals being suffered across the Western world, um, including my own country, Britain, uh, the United States, elsewhere, um, to try and explain why. And uh, my publishers tried to get me to change the title from The Retreat of uh, Western Liberalism to The Collapse of Western Liberalism. Um, and I resisted and I retained retreat. And I'm very glad I did um, because sitting here talking to you about the first seven weeks of Biden um, at the end, well, not at the end, but one year into um, a global pandemic um, is a reminder that nothing is predictable. Um, I would not have imagined that if you told me 18 months ago that America would spend 25% of its GDP, mostly skewed towards the poorer, a highly necessary um, fiscal corrective. I would, not, I would not have found that a remotely feasible um, scenario. American um, exceptionalism um, is something, and I think you have Indian exceptionalism too, uh, is something that Kissinger in his talk with me worried about. Um, American exceptionalism is what helped breed the complacency that led to the rise of Trump. When you have a, a sort of cultural um, self-adulation um, like exceptionalism does and the British suffer from their own version of it, um, you tend to stop thinking realistically. You tend to stop thinking practically. And I think if the recent history of the United States um, and indeed of India teaches us anything is that it's never over. You know, Benjamin Franklin famously said the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Well, it's never over. The battle for a just and um, fair society is never won. It keeps having to be refought again and again. Well, what we find today is a brief window with uh, I think of a very decent man as American president. And again, you know, I can't believe I'm using those words. We have a decent man as American president. We have a brief window um, in which some of these gross distempers in American society and in American democracy might be redressed. Um, I very much hope they will be. Um, and I very much look forward also to um, hearing from you um, what you think about this.
Um, so I'll turn it back to, I don't know whether it's Manish or it is. Yes. Thank you, Ed. That was spectacular. Absolutely. So um, I'd urge all everybody in the audience to post their questions on the chat box, but I'll get started with um, asking a few questions. Um, even when you sort of wrote, wrote Retreat of Western Liberalism, when I read it, it felt like you were saying that Trump is, is not a passing shower. It, there is climate change here, right? And um, why do you think that? Is this race and religion or is this economics and inequality? Is the rise of Trump, is it, is it race and religion or is it economics, the stagnation of the real wage and inequality or? I think it's both. I mean, there's been this rather theological debate amongst scholars and journalists that either this is the, the root of this is racism or the root of this is economic stagnation, the hollowing out of the middle class. Uh, I, I don't think that these are uh, separable. Um, I, I think that the um, sort of waning of optimism about the American dream, the stagnation of incomes, the decline in life expectancy, which is not something that happens during peacetime normally, um, that you've now seen for three consecutive years before the pandemic. Um, the um, uh, creates the ripe conditions for people to harvest politicians to harvest resentment for their own electoral ends, um, and so I think that you know this is neither economic anxiety alone or what is euphemistically called cultural anxiety about a um, multiracial, multiethnic, the emerging demographic ma majority, as they call it. It's both. Um, people um, are happy to tolerate differences when they feel it isn't a zero-sum game. When it becomes a zero-sum game, then the whole climate changes. And Trump, of course, was um, a sort of Olympic medalist at, at finding that resentment and coining, coining votes out of it. So is there something going on in the economy which is making people feel it's a zero sum game or is this just technologies, the, inner, the march of technology is reducing jobs and employment or is there something in the American economy which has changed from the 60s, 70s or 50s or whenever people didn't view the economy as a zero sum game? Uh, yes, there's um, largely the impact of technology. Again, people talk about technology and globalization as if they're different things, but they're, they're essentially the same thing. You talk about technology enabled globalization. It's technology that enables offshoring, outsourcing and so forth. And why I think America and Britain have been hit worse by populism than um, democracies like Germany is that the support um, of, of the public sector, whether it be a local or, or national, uh, the safety net, um, the ready day um, assistance to people to help transition to the new economy in terms of being educated and in terms of having the funds to carry them over in that transition has been decimated um, in the, the US and the UK to a far greater extent um, than, than most other Western democracies are, and not all. Um, I also think that, you know, the Cold War, we were talking about a Cold War earlier, I was. Um, the Soviet Union claimed to be a worker's paradise. That, that kept the West honest. They needed to show that workers do better in the West, that they are more prosperous um, than, uh, than they were in the Soviet bloc, and they did. Um, but then the Cold War ended and that whole sort of pressure disappeared. So I think it's no accident that the high noon of neoliberalism occurs really after the end of the Cold War. So do you think this uh, economic anxiety shows up in economic policy or it, it, how does it show up in economic policy in the US? Is it just in, in just more debt or, or, or this kind or does it show up in other ways? Well, if you're talking about recent economic policy, this extraordinary 1.9 trillion stimulus, um, it's targeted, there are checks going to everybody, basically everybody, you know, other than the sort of top 10, 15% is getting a $1,400 check. 
people with children are getting several hundred dollar checks per child. The unemployment benefit is being extended. Um, state and local governments are getting several hundred billion dollars not to fire, you know, um, health workers and police, etc. Um, so these are all very middle class um, sort of assistance measures. And it's wildly popular. I mean, this is popular with Republicans. Shouldn't forget that Trump ran uh, as a very different kind of Republican. He didn't run as a Reagan Republican. He ran saying, I will protect your social security. I will build in infrastructure. And it was plausible because, you know, the guy puts his name on buildings. Um, infrastructure sounded plausible. Uh, he didn't do any of this. Um, so there was kind of a bait and switch. What my colleague um, Martin Wolf calls Pluto populism. You culturally make people feel like you're on their side um, whilst basically picking their pockets. Um, and Trump was the apotheosis of Pluto populism. He, he, he didn't deliver the kinds of um, things that the American middle class, white, not white, racist, not racist, all want, um, which is more support. So if economic uh, sort of anxiety is, is sort of gets uh, a larger social security system and an expansion of, of, the, of the big government, how will cultural anxiety show up in policy or will Democrats ignore, uh, they don't need to deal with cultural anxiety or, or do you, could you guess on how cultural anxiety could be addressed by Democrats? Will they turn on immigration? Will they turn in other ways? Will they have to respond to the 74 million voters of Trump? Um, I think that uh, if, if Biden's luck, um, Napoleonic luck continues, um, and we do get a strong rebound, um, then uh, I think some of that will be drained. There's never going to be a way of defeating a sort of hardcore 15, 20% of Americans who I think are, are just basically opposed to multicultural society. And, to, and, and fear a multi-ethnic America. There is, there is racism there that probably can't be defeated, but the fellow travelers who helped give Trump a majority, um, yeah, they can be picked off. Um, you know, there were millions of people who voted for Obama, who voted for Trump, who switched. Now, maybe they were racist when they voted for Obama, but his skin color didn't matter so much that they didn't vote for Obama. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that America is post-racial, which I you know, remember very well people saying in the wake of Obama's victory, that now we can forget our history, um, that it's over. That, that's clearly, that was clearly a little bit too Panglossian. That, that, that wasn't uh, merited. Um, I have one fear here, which is that the politics of critical race theory um, is going to um, it's going to provoke a, a white lash, um, if you like. There is this sense that whites are sort of ancestrally responsible for slavery, um, and there's nothing they can really do to absolve themselves of that responsibility, which is, you know, you can get into, well, which whites are you talking? Are you talking about descendants of people in the South? Are you talking about descendants of Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants? What do they have to do with, you know? I mean, once you get into the only essential thing about you is your color and you're white, then I don't think you're getting into a good place there. And there is part of the left that is a very culturally woke, very, very awakened um, um, critical race theory left is what I think of it as. And I don't think that ends in a good place. You know, if you have a disagreement over the size of government, you can split the difference. It's a question of mathematics. If you have a disagreement over biology, there's not too many sort of compromises there. You can't really split differences. So there's a question from Professor Jairam. How would Biden deal with racism? <laughs> well, America desperately needs um, criminal justice reform. Um, the degree to which the system targets um, African-Americans in particular. I mean, I think we're used to talking about it as being whites versus everyone else. To a large extent, it's African-Americans and everyone else. Um, you know, I don't think Indian Americans and Japanese Americans are particularly discriminated against. There's not much of a legacy there. Uh, the, the, the real issue here is African-Americans. 
Um, and the penal system is a deeply biased um, system. Policing, as we've seen, deeply biased. Um, voter suppression, deeply targeted at African-Americans. Um, so there's all kinds of things he can do. And I think he's already sort of beginning to do through the Department of Justice um, to attempt to redress these issues, which are deeply important ones. They need to be tackled. Um, but, you know, as I, I hate to go back, you know, I'm not a Marxist, but economics is important. Um, and giving people, you know, when Procter & Gamble or some Fortune 500 company says we've got a diversity policy, and you know we're going to have x y and z um you know in our upper echelons of management great but also pay the janitors of a minimum wage of 15 dollars an hour if you if you actually mean mean what you say about diversity you need to think about socioeconomic diversity you need to pay people proper wages and i think you'll find that most african americans um, would like that $15 an hour minimum wage, just like most whites who don't get it would like it. They can be united on this point. So there are a bunch of questions. You've answered the criminal justice question, which Kirit had, but there are a bunch of questions on China and, and Nirupama's, uh, Nirupama Rao. Will the Biden policy be a continuation of the Trump policy or will it be competition tempered by a dose of cooperation? And just a connected question is, would the impactful strategist Henry Kissinger have acted differently if he could have predicted the rise of China to the extent that was impacted by his actions? You know, I, I remember Warren Buffett once said that if airline investors were around, then they should have shot down the Wright brothers when they flew. I've heard an American worker say that we should have shot down Kissinger's plane when they went to China. You know, so if he hadn't done that, then we wouldn't have reached where we are, but would love to get your take on that. Uh, can you repeat Nirupama's question? Hi, Nirupama, by the way, lovely to hear your name. Will the, will the Biden policy to China be a continuation of Trump policy or will it be different? Uh, uh, that, I'll deal with that first. It's a, it's, it's a very good question. I think it will be, I think the diagnosis of the Biden people is not that much different than Trump's diagnosis. There is a consensus in Washington, D.C. that China is a challenger power, that that Thucydides trap is basically what we're in, the existing hegemon, the rising hegemon. And I think that's a consensus. Um, where they will and already are radically differing is in tactics. Um, Biden is a highly predictable um, person. He um, has a team of highly predictable foreign policy specialists, you know, Jake Sullivan, whom I know, um, Tony Blinken, plenty of others um, who um, will signal and uh, telegraph what the administration is doing well in advance. There's not gonna be diplomacy by tweet. You're not gonna suddenly wake up and find that, you know, your aluminum and steel exports have a 20% tariff or that um, America's, um, demanding you double your soybean imports or um, that um, all Chinese tech companies are overnight banned from the United States. It's going to be a much more calibrated, telegraphed foreign policy, but very, very little different in strategic aim to what um, Trump wished to do. I think the biggest tactical difference is that Biden wants to work with allies and partners and Trump had contempt for allies and partners. It was a very self-defeating, a very self-defeating way uh, of approaching diplomacy. Um, Biden understands that America is powerful when it acts collectively. Um, and that, you know, China has only one ally in North Korea and America has dozens. And so I think repairing alliances is, is, is probably the most important distinction in addition to the temperamental sort of character difference with Trump. The, um, should Kissinger's plane have been shot down um, en route to, to Beijing? Um, the Sino-Soviet split and America's exploitation of it was in chessboard sort of terms, you know, probably the, the grandest move um, of the American Cold War. It's, I think, what ultimately did for the Soviet Union. You could argue that it, its own sclerosis, its own sort of gerontocratic um, stagnation was the prime cause of the Soviet Union's collapse. But I certainly wouldn't um, 
I certainly wouldn't downplay the shift of China into the American camp. It's been um, a beneficiary of the Pax Americana, the global system joining the WTO. Um, and America has increasingly in the last 15 to 20 years um, come to see China as the um, scapegoat as well as the culprit for the hollowing out of industrial America. Um, I have to say, I don't think that's correct. Um, you know, I think China has fewer manufacturing jobs today than it did five years ago. Uh, America has fewer manufacturing jobs, but it produces more. So we're not really in a manufacturing crisis. We're in a manufacturing employment crisis. This is about automation. Um, and it's therefore about the failure of the United States to equip its workforce for the needs of today's labor market um, and to provide the kind of social safety net that I talked about earlier. It's interesting that countries with good social, social safety nets like Germany are not scapegoating China for everything because there is a certain degree of social peace in the labor force. So there are a bunch of questions about foreign policy. Let me just bunch three of them together. Vijay asks, in your talk, Russia doesn't figure, you know, has it become irrelevant? Um, Rohini um, Nilikini asks, uh, well, how long will it take to restore the trust of Europe in the US and can President Biden even manage this? And um, uh, Buddha Bagai says that, um, you know, basically thanks to the control of the Pakistani army, India has um, suffered and US has per perhaps unwittingly diluted democracy in Pakistan. How do you think Pakistan's, uh, the policy towards Pakistan will be for Biden? I'll start with Russia. You're right, I didn't mention um, Russia. Um, I mean, it's interesting, there are some people, you know, having referred to Kissinger and Brzezinski earlier, there are some people who want to see a reverse Kissinger a uh, reverse Brzezinski, in other words, to break off Russia from its close relationship with China. Um, and, you know, not to pay too much attention to Putin's human rights violations, et cetera, um, uh, in order to incentivize him to look more West and less East. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen because I think the values element to Biden is too important. Um, but Russia, we should not forget um, you know, is uh, a fraction the size of China economically. It's about the same size as the Italian economy, um, which is not insignificant, but it's not one of the global big players um, any longer, except in energy. Um, so um, the, the, the threat posed by, by Russia is very much to do with um, its geopolitical ambitions, um, which leads me on to the Europe question. Um, the Europeans are not clamoring to join a US-led global democracy revival movement. Um, Europeans are split on this question. Of course, you have some European countries like Poland and Hungary that are very much populist. Um, Viktor Orban is you know, um, the man who coined the phrase illiberal democracy. Um, you have others like Germany that you know, export four times as many Volkswagens to China as they do to, to the United States that have a, you know, a, a, a mercantilist incentive in, in not having um, too binary a, a world. Britain has left the European Union. So that voice within the EU to shape it in a more Atlanticist direction has gone. And uh, Emmanuel Macron, France's president, uh, is talking about creating European strategic autonomy, meaning less dependent on the United States. Meanwhile, uh, this Nord Stream 2 pipeline um, from Russia is nearing completion. Merkel is no more susceptible to Biden's charms on that issue than she was to Trump's. Um, so there is a real po politique here that makes it quite hard for America to actually be back. Uh, I mean, I quoted that Heraclitus earlier, you don't step into the same river twice. This is a different river. Um, so I think inevitably any cooperation that we're gonna see, and this in American eyes will hopefully include India. I'm skeptical, but it will hopefully has to be on technology. 
It has to be on the technology systems we have, um, on the internet regulations we have, um, on 5G, on AI, on robotics. That's where the real game is. And that, I guess, is something the Biden administration is more and more going to try to get both transatlantic and Indo-Pacific um, cooperation on. The Pakistan question? Oh, Pakistan. Well, <laughs> you know, it's hard to answer the Pakistan question without looking at this looming deadline um, of May the 1st for the United States to withdraw its remaining 2,500 troops. Um, and um, I don't think America is going to withdraw its remaining 2,500 troops because it's not very many troops for arguably quite a lot of protection um, for the Afghan government from the Taliban. And I think the sort of potential images of the Taliban regaining control of Kabul are too, um, too visceral for Biden to, to take that risk. Therefore, we're going to have a continuation of this very, very uneasy, completely insoluble US-Pakistan relationship in which they pretend to be helping, um, but with the other hand are doing the opposite. And I, 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 I am trying to imagine the day when Pakistan doesn't do that, and it would be a day where the military isn't the predominant institution. How we get from here to that day is higher than my pay grade. Uh, Pia Krishnan Kutti asked a sort of related question that Biden and Kamala were vocal about the situation in Kashmir and the Citi Citizen Amendment Act during the election campaign. I think you answered this question, but she asked, do you think those concerns will be aired or will they sp swept under the rug as Washington looks to India to counter China? I think that um, a lot depends on whether the Citizens Amendment Bill um, law um, and related the national registry. If, if these things are sort of revived after whatever the farmers protest demonstrations, you know, recede and Modi's sort of back in um, master of his agenda, if he does sort of revive these with a vengeance, it's going to create a lot of pressure on the Biden administration to criticize India. Um, ditto with um, Kashmir. So, you know, there's always going to be that tendency. And I think it's usually there more with Democratic administrations, from the Indian point of view, than Republicans, that, uh, that Americans tend to preach and Indians don't like it. Um, I have to say, I think that Modi deserves all the criticism coming his way from everybody, but it's probably counterproductive coming from an American administration. And um, I think the Biden people will probably learn to understand this if they don't already. So there are a lot of questions on politics, but we'll come back to that, you back to US politics. But Nandan Nilikani is asking, what do the appointments of Lena Khan to the FTC, Tim Wu to the NEC, and Vanita Gupta as Associate General, and Rohit Chopra as the head of CF? EB signify. They are all war and progressives. Will this mean more focus on big tech and big business? Yeah, they're not just all war and pro progressives. They're all Asian Americans and three out of four of them are um, South Asian Americans. Well, actually, uh, I think Indian Americans. Um, these are, um, as, as you point out, Nandan, um, people who've given a lot of thought to um, antitrust action um, on big tech. Um, and they do tend to um, be on the Warren wing of the party. You're quite right to mention that. Um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, talks of um, foreign policy for the middle class. Now, what this means is ultimately industrial policy. Industrial policy is something that we haven't really heard since the days of Eisenhower and Kennedy, the days that sort of through DARPA and uh, the ARPANET gave us so many of the uh, innovations that, that undergird Silicon Valley. Um, and I think there is a strong um, view within the Biden administration that industrial policy must be combined with proper regulation of big tech. Um, the fact that um, uh, you have so much concentration in the American economy um, is I think seen as um, not unrelated um, to the declining bargaining power of labor. And it's the bar declining bargaining power of labor um, that has created such populism, particularly 
um, in foreign policy. So where they in practical terms end up, I don't know. Are we going to get Facebook forced to divest WhatsApp and um, and Instagram? Would that really make any difference if they were? Um, I think these kinds of debates are being had. Um, should European style privacy laws be imported? Um, should um, people be paid for the data that they provide um, to companies? Should we have German style regulation of speech on social media because we really can't you know, leave it up to Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg to decide whether a president is on their platform or not. It's such an important part of speech. Um, all of these questions I know are in ferment, um, but the one I would point you to as the most important is there is a desire for industrial policy. And it's been a toxic word, term, industrial policy for 40 or more years in the United States. Now it's back in fashion. So I'll try and bunch a bunch of questions about US politics. I think they want to go back that people are puzzled by the bipolar nature of political parties in the US. It's almost like they're two different um, worldviews. So, you know, how will this get resolved? How can American politics ever transform? And why did, uh, if you were given a time machine and could go back in time, which year would you go back to partly correct the mistakes which have led to what happens in American politics today. Hmm. So it's people sort of worried about, will it, will it ever heal itself? And, and where did this start? Um, I, I mean, I would probably sort of leapfrog across a number of years, but if I had to choose one in terms of the tone of American politics, I, I would probably go back to 1994 and ensure that whatever plane uh, Newt Gingrich was flying into DC on didn't crash. I do not wish to see people burning in flames, but uh, the, that it was diverted to Alaska or somewhere, or Cuba actually, you know, that, yes, Havana. I would divert Newt Gingrich's flight to Havana because Gingrich as speaker, um, halfway through Clinton's first term, changed the nature of American politics. Um, he made bipartisan action impossible. And the American system is predicated on the idea that you have loose and continually shifting coalitions, um, that no faction becomes crystallized. It's not a parliamentary system with parliamentary voting discipline. That works in a Westminster system. Um, Gingrich changed all that. Um, and he turned into, he turned the Republicans into a party that essentially, um, wanted to create a defeat with every bill. Um, so Obama pushes through health care reform based on the health care reform Mitt Romney pushed through as Republican governor of Massachusetts, which itself was based on the Heritage Foundation, the Conservative Foundation, very conservative plan, free market based health care reform. Obama, being a moderate centrist, chooses the free market plan um, they declare the Republicans in Gingrich style that they will turn this into his Waterloo, that they will, um, that they will defeat Obama um, because that's the game to defeat Obama. That's not how American politics used to work. Um, and so that sort of change, that polarization is something I would date back to Newt Gingrich, but you can pick, you know, a lot of, um, you can pick a lot of characters. You could pick Rupert Murdoch, who sort of softened up the culture for Gingrichism to succeed. You could pick Rush Limbaugh, the, the conservative talk radio guy who just died a few weeks ago. Um, you could pick a lot of forerunners to Donald Trump that created the conditions for Donald Trump to succeed. But I think the basic point is that people didn't suddenly just become cynical about politics in America. It took decades to get to this point. I guess uh, Ramji asked a related question. Did the checks, balance, checks and balances work to check Trump successes or they weren't sufficient? And then Saras Ganapati asks, you know, can Biden's decency prevail against the Republican Senate that votes as a block, evangelicals, petroleum industry, et cetera? Um, let me take Saras's first. Um, 
you know, this this 50 plus one is actually quite convenient for Biden um, because otherwise, you know, the left would have a lot more sway um, if it was 61 that they had in the Senate and a majority of 40 or 50 in the House as opposed to 15 or so 12 or 15, um, then the left would have much, much more sway um, and Biden's real battle would be with the left. Um, right now, he can use the fact that they've only got 50 votes in the Senate as discipline to say, look, it's this or nothing and get through the kinds of, by his standards, centrist bills that, um, that he wants to get through. I think though that probably we've seen the penultimate one, if not the last one, with this COVID relief bill. Um, he's got immigration reform. There's going to be several moderate, inverted commas, moderate Democrats who will oppose it for not being draconian enough on the border wall, not being Trumpian enough. Um, he um, has got a restore democracy bill and the John Lewis voting rights bill, which would outlaw gerrymandering which would register, enable people to register to vote on the same day. It would automatically register people, I think. Um, all kinds of really important reforms that, that the Republicans will um, fight tooth and nail, but they'll get some Democrats with them. So the way I see it, there's two parties right now. There's the Democratic Party and there's Joe Manchin. And Joe Manchin is this um, Democratic Senator, centrist Senator from West Virginia who has, is having the time of his life. I um, mean, basically he can direct all the pork, you know, in America to West Virginia as the price for voting for any of these bills. Um, uh, the ultimate debate is gonna come down to whether to abolish the filibuster, which is, appears nowhere in America's constitution. It was developed really during the mid 19th century by Southern senators as a way of killing legislation that would reduce the rights of slave states. Um, it was then revived um, to oppose civil rights legislation in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I think it would be a brilliant way of heralding a new era in American politics to say, we are going to abolish the filibuster so that we can give statehood to Washington DC and Puerto Rico and the American Virgin Islands. We are going to abolish essentially a Jim Crow device that is nowhere in the constitution um, in order to expand the franchise to those states in America that aren't yet recognized as states that also happen to be non-white. Um, uh, that would be crossing a nuclear threshold though. Um, and again, this is a debate. This is, this is something Biden as a traditionalist is gonna to have to be forced to do. Um, but I've no doubt that there is going to be growing pressure on him to do this as you, as you see one after other of these bills die in the Senate. So is there talk of um, election reform? Is there talk of, you know, counting faster? Is there talk of not being so decentralized, like, like a sort of election commission reform, this whole debate of popular vote versus electoral college? Do you think there's going to be some election reform other than your outlining, you said, out outlawing gerrymandering and sort of voter registration, but just the process is so decentralized or that decentralization is so core to America's identity that um, we will always have these distributed and, you know, multiple counting and, and, and that gives the basis for people to say that the election was stolen or not really. Oh, well, I mean, let's just sort of indulge a thought experiment that these two bills I mentioned, the John Lewis Voting Act and the um, American uh, Protect, Protecting American Democracy Act, I think it's called that. Let's say these two bills were passed and signed into law. I don't think there's any chance of that happening. Um, they would then be appealed and they would go up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court would, I promise you, strike them down. They would not, they would not be actually be um, um, put into effect because the Supreme Court would say, under the constitution, it's states that determine how they vote and how their electors are elected. Um, it's not the federal government. Um, and so, you know, there are gonna be federal attempts to um, change these things, but the only ones that are gonna get past this Supreme Court, um, which is originalist, that's the name of its judicial philosophy. The only ones that'll get past them are amendments to the constitution. 
that you'd have to amend the constitution basically. And to amend the constitution, you need two thirds of each chamber plus three quarters of America's states to ratify. Uh, you know, those states, think of South Dakota, like 400,000 people, two senators. Whereas California, 40 million people, two senators. Now you can imagine small states really love the system and there are more small states than large states. This would be like Turkey's voting for Christmas. They're not going to vote for it. They, they're going to, uh, so my concern, my longer term concern with America is this, this minority veto over democracy um, gets more and more acute as time goes on. Um, the judicial branch is really for the next 20 years in the hands of originalists who are going to be a backstop to any democratic attempts to change that system. And then the ultimate way of changing it, the only real way of changing it, which is by constitutional amendment, is impossible. Um, so my concern is the, 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 the demographic majority are going to get extremely frustrated as they find themselves blocked again and again. Um, and um, it's very hard to see a way out of it. So what are the chances, this is a high, low question, what are the chances of Donald Trump being the Republican candidate for the president in 24? That's impossible to answer. I mean, he wants people to think he's going to be, you know, whether that means he will, um, I don't know, but he, he wants to monetize, you know, um, his name and uh, being kicked off Twitter and Facebook makes it much harder for him to monetize his name. Um, his clubs are doing very badly. The golf clubs are all losing money. Um, his property business is being picked apart by federal and New York investigators. Um, uh, so to sort of go back to a question earlier that I skipped accidentally, you know, the system to a large degree is working. Um, the, um, the, the, the legal system, the wheels move slow. Um, but there are sort of parallel criminal investigations into the way he's into allegations of tax fraud, bank fraud, um, and other and other financial crimes um, that are going to tie him up in knots and his organization up in knots for years to come uh, in an organization that's losing money and that owes a lot of money and no bank will touch him. Uh, in the decade before he became president, only one bank would touch him. That was Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank said now they're not going to touch him. Um, so I don't know if there's some, you know, Russian SPACs or, or something that can, you know, extend him alone. But basically, he's desperate for money. Um, and the way to monetize is to be in the public eye. And the way to be in the public eye is to be thought of as the nominee in 2024. Whether that actually means he will be is another, a whole nother question, but it ought to be stressed. Most of his children uh, and, and in uh, like one of his daughter-in-laws are planning to run for office. Um, so, you know, um, Ivanka wants to run. Lara Trump, who's his daughter-in-law, wants to run. Donald Trump Jr., God forbid, wants to run. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of Trumps looking to monetize the Trump name. So we're running out of time here, but I wanted to zoom out on a, on a question which said the, whether you agree the world is relapsing into sort of the more it found itself in 1945. This is from Ravi Rajgopalan, which is a bipolar world where you're diametrically opposed to each other politically, economically, and ideologically. But the difference this time is that economic interlinkages are much higher between US and China than the US. So will you say that the Biden administration will talk less about democracy and consolidate front Frontiers, and this has important implications for sort of India. Uh, I think he's going to talk quite a bit about democracy, um, but I don't think it's going to be, um, you know, with a neoconservative undertone. I don't think that the idea of democracy, you know, um, being delivered by tanks or drones, whatever, um, is, I, I think that that's anathema to these people. These are experienced decent people. Some of them were on the wrong side in the Iraq war, by which I mean they supported it. But I think I probably learned, um, have learned what a catastrophic mistake the Iraq war was for the United States and for the world. Um, so I think Biden is going to, he's going to be very good at what I call the constant gardening of diplomacy. 
very difficult, by the way, in Zoom times. You really do need to meet people to, to get proper diplomacy done. Um, but that'll come. Um, I think he's going to have to sort of hold contradictory thoughts in his head at the same time, um, you know, about confronting China and cooperating with China. Um, I think that's the path he would like to, um, to plow. Um, um, and I think that, you know, like any president, events, uh, how he responds to events, which can't be predicted, will define what he's like. So right now I'm just giving you the sort of outlines, but we will, we will see him when he responds to events. Um, and, um, you know, let's hope that they're not events uh, up in the Himalayas or in the South China Sea or uh, over Taiwan, um, and that they're more about trade, technology, intellectual property protection, um, which, you know, where deals can be done. Um, and just as a sort of final point, decoupling is a term very glibly used. Decoupling from China basically means deglobalization. It means dismantling. You know, you, you can't shift it all to India and Vietnam. Um, so I don't think decoupling is going to happen, but I do think there's going to be massive competition um, for China to indigenize the spare parts it doesn't have to become a semiconductor leader. Um, and for the West and uh, plus partners like India to come up with an alternative to Huawei to name two of the sort of more immediate term challenges. Well, we're completely out of time. I apologize to the questions I haven't been able to get to and I request Nirja, can you come and close this, my colleague? Such a pity that such engaging conversations must come to an end. Um, Edward Luce just gave us a report card on the first seven weeks of the Biden administration that looked quite decent. Um, that democratic backsliding in the US has been checked somewhat is a matter of considerable satisfaction and not a little envy. Uh, though, of course, as you said, it's a little early to say how enduring that will be. And you gave us many reasons to worry about the fragility of this democratic rebound and the resilience of populism. On behalf of the New India Foundation, it's an absolute pleasure to thank Edward Luce for delivering a superb and superbly fitting lecture in memory of the legendary Girish Karnad, followed by a phenomenally wide ranging discussion with Manish Savarwal and the audience. We are grateful to D. Ravi Chandar and the Bangalore International Center for co-hosting this event. This is not the first time that the BIC has partnered with the NIF and we look forward to a continuing and mutually enriching partnership with the Bangalore International Center. And finally, it remains for me to thank Smriti Khanna Mehra and Himali Sodhi for the incredibly hard work that they put into advanced publicity for this event. Thank you again, Edward Luce, and thank you all very much. Thanks, Ed. Have a, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Talk you to you. Thanks. That was Bye. wonderful. Thank you. I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. <laughs>